I have seen a number of interviews over the years where journalists have gone out and interviewed centenarians, hundred-year-olds, about their lives. You know, the, the, the interviews generally go the same way. They generally uh, talk about the person's life, the remarkable things that have gone on in the past 100 years or so, uh, and there have been a great deal of things that have gone on uh, that are, are hard to fathom as changes. But these interviews always come around to a key question in the end. And that key question, of course, is what is the secret of your long life? How, how did you get to live this long? And uh, there are usually themes that go around this. There, people will talk about their family, they'll talk about uh, exercise or diet, perhaps. Um, but I'll be honest, when I hear those interviews, when I see them, uh, there's part of me, the, the, the left brain logical guy, that says, ah, oh, there's no secret. They don't know why they made it that, that far. They're, they're just happy they're alive and, and active at that age. But there's also part of me that sits watching that interview thinking, are they going to say something that's actually insightful? Are, are they going to say something that, that actually kind of plays out and, and could be helpful? Um, what, what's the answer to that key question? I, and I think there are a number of us. I don't think I'm alone in, in if there were a secret to living a long, good life, that we would be all ears. Last week we talked about Psalm 1, and in Psalm 1 we, we heard how the tree in the desert maintains its life. The secret to its success is that it's, it's planted near a stream, and, it, and its roots drive deep into the ground, and, and it can provide life when there are harsh conditions around it. Well, we're going to take a little different view on the same kind of theme this week in Proverbs uh, chapter 3. Open your Bible right now with me uh, to Proverbs chapter 3. It's right after Psalms. And we're going to read verses 1 through 12 of chapter 3. Pause the video so you can locate it. And when you have found uh, your spot, go ahead and restart, and we're going to, to read together. Here's what Proverbs 3 says. My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline, and do not resent his rebuke, because the Lord disciplines those he loves, as a father the son he delights in. This is God's word for us today. Pray with me. Lord, help us to understand your word. Your desire is good for us, and your desire for us is that we would have good lives. You didn't create us for, for trouble, as this world has, but you created us to have significance and meaning, and to know you and be known by you. So help us with this text. Uh, help us to understand how we might live in the midst of fallenness and brokenness and to uh, still live a measure of that good life that you had designed for us. Guard my words. Uh, where I go off track or where um, I do not speak in line with your word, correct me. Strengthen me. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be holy and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, last week when we talked about Psalm 1, we saw that the, the uh, wise man delighted in the law of the Lord. This week we're going to see how the wise child remembers and lives. That seems like a cryptic phrase, but bear with me on that, and let's work through the first half of this proverb together. This is going to be a two-week kind of exploration of uh, Proverbs 3, 1 through 12. There's just too much in here to really kind of deal with in one week, and so we're going to break parts of it up. And so if you feel this week that uh, you're asking the question, but how, but how, but how, understand that right now what we're doing is we're building a, 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 a foundation on which we're going to lay how. Um, and so there has, what we want to bring into this foundation is that there has been a theme developing for the past several weeks. We have seen it in Ecclesiastes uh, in a roundabout way. We saw it in uh, Psalm 1 last week, and we're seeing it very, very explicitly here in Proverbs 3. If you haven't guessed it yet, God's law, uh, His commands, His teachings, are at the heart of wisdom. God's law, His teachings, are at the heart of wisdom. And, and this is the foundation that we're going to build on. Really, uh, everything in Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, and even if you read it, Job, uh, if you go and, and read Job sometime, assumes that God's law um, and His teachings are the foundation are, on which wisdom is built. And so there is no wisdom, uh, as we saw in Ecclesiastes, apart from those teachings. There may be pragmatic ways to, to get about life with the least amount of resistance, but it really isn't wisdom in the way that uh, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job really talk about it. Um, when we talk about God's law, I, I, let me f first say that, you know, Katie may dispute it, but I, I'm really kind of a task-oriented kind of a person. Um, I use a task management software in my planning. In fact, um, the, the weekly sermons have their own uh, set of task, uh, tasks and subtasks. Somewhere between 50 and 70 things that I have to do in order to, to get uh, the service up and running each and every week. And, and I will say that I take a, uh, a measure of delight and pleasure in checking off those items each and every week. And even beyond that, uh, you know, at home I might make a list uh, on, uh, you know, just any tablet or a, a spare envelope that we have around and uh, write down what I need to do for the day or write down what the boys need to do for the day. And I take joy when those things get crossed off and when things get done. Um, and in fact, uh, I was telling Katie today after she came back from a bike ride with the boys uh, about some things that I had accomplished. I had planted a couple of things and I had uh, taken care of another, a couple other tasks that had been on my list for a while in the back of my head. No one else saw it, but they were there. And I, I, I was relaying to her while she was reading a book, mind you, uh, about my joy and interrupting her joy with mine. Um, and I usually enjoy sharing what I've done. Perhaps you're the same way. If you're a task-oriented person, uh, you may be taking, uh, not taking pleasure in this, but you may be uh, uh, feeling what I feel and, oh yes, I like the feeling of seeing those things crossed off and getting the, the job done. Now, why did I go off on this strange excursus uh, uh, about task being task-oriented? Well, it, it does relate, because I fear that when we talk about God's law, when we talk about His teachings, when we talk about um, obeying God, that we view it in a very task-oriented type of way. Uh, you know, the, the law is do this, don't do this, uh, go here, stay away from there. It, it's like it's a list of things to do and to not do that we can check off. Um, 
and uh, you know at the end of the day have a list if we get so many check marks if we get so many things on our list then woohoo we get to go to heaven um, the, the problem with that of course is um, the whole issue about Christ and grace uh, you know uh, Christ's grace opens heaven but that has to more to do about restoring our relationship with God than it has to do with earning enough points to get a comfortable eternity. And hopefully if you hear me saying that in a very English way, in a very understated way, it has everything to do with having a right relationship with God and with one another. Uh, that, uh, that Having that right relationship that, that flows from a right relationship with God. Um, so the question is, if that's not what God's law does, if it's not a, a list of tasks so that we can check it off and have enough points, then, then what is the point of God's law? What does it do? Well, one of the things that God's law does, and there are a couple things here, and I'll say there are a couple of things that I'm not going to talk about with respect to God's law. Um, but one of the things that it does is it brings order to the chaos of our lives. You know, life is chaotic. I, I, right now is a perfect example of that. What we used to take for very, very simple tasks, I'm going to go to the grocery store, is now a, a, uh, an ordeal fraught with ethical concerns at every turn. Uh, it, from simply from uh, the the ongoing but uh, uh, the ongoing discussion about face masks in our country uh, to the arrows that are on the floor uh, at the end of each aisle and it's 10 p.m. at high V there's there's no one in this aisle or the aisles next to it should I follow the arrow uh, and so there's a their life is right now fraught with chaos. And one of the things that God's law does, like I said, um, is it brings order to that. And the reality is all of life has, de uh, has decisions and responsibilities that can feel very chaotic and overwhelming. Um, that chaos is no respecter of anyone. It's true in all of our lives. Um, and so this is a way that, that uh, God's law provides order. It provides a way uh, for dealing with it. Now, when I was thinking about this, one of the, the times in my life, uh, as an example, uh, that it brought up was um, one of the first times that Katie left me home alone with Ian after he was born. And... It, things started out okay, and I remember uh, that after a while, Ian started crying. And I couldn't get him to stop crying. I couldn't figure out what it was that, that he needed or he wanted or, or whatnot, and, and it became this incessant cry. Now, in, in uh, the parenting classes before, uh, before Ian came, um, one of the things that they said is if you get into a situation like that, they taught us, put the child down in a safe spot and call someone to, to help. Um, and fortunately in that moment, by the grace of God, I had the presence of mind to think about that. Because that is a chaotic situation. And, and I did. I put him in a space, safe spot. I called Katie. Um, and, and in the middle of that chaos, that simple rule helped to bring order to bring about more order in that situation. Um, and that's what God's law does for us. When we're faced with these problems, when we're faced with situations, um, when we see God's law, and, and it's so deep in our hearts that it's reflexive, that we're able to think of it in the chaos, it helps to bring order in that chaos. Another way to explain this, I wore glasses for years, um, and I, I've been through a number of optometrists uh, appointments where they ask the famous question, better one or better two, uh, better three or better four. And um, 
you know, like a good set of glasses or contacts brings clarity to the world. It makes order out of the chaos of, of our eyes. Studying God's teaching in Scripture brings clarity to our vision of God and of the world around us. Um, but first and foremost, to the character of God. That, that's where our, our, our clarity first and foremost should be. Um, because God's commands are more than rules to be followed. They show God's character. If we don't see God's character in his teachings, then we are missing a very, very important aspect of what God is telling us. We need to be able to see God's character in what he teaches us. You know, Hebrew poetry, uh, getting back to, to Proverbs 3 specifically, uh, Hebrew poetry can be fun to... Um, to analyze. It can be fun to to read and to understand because oftentimes clues to the meaning are are right there in parallel lines. Um, when the teacher, uh, most likely Solomon, starts out in verse 1 talking about, uh, my son do not forget my teaching but keep my commands in your heart, um, we get insight as to what that means in verse 3. Because he says, let love and faithfulness never leave you. Hebrew poetry likes to do that. It likes to put things in parallel to each other. Where uh, it either says uh, that there, these things are, uh, one is like the other, or one is not like the other, or one is a larger form of the other. And so here, when we see Solomon ta seeing my teachings, and he's talking about God's law. One of the great parts that we can pull from that then is to look and say, let love and faithfulness uh, never leave you. And you go, so you are calling God's law love and faithfulness. And incidentally, when he says, don't forget, to remember in Hebrew is, is the same way of saying obey. So it's not simply calling to mind, it's, it's obedience. But we see here, uh, obey, love, and faithfulness. The word here that we get as love is actually a, a wonderfully deep and rich word uh, that describes God's love for his people across time. Uh, across the ages. Uh, sometimes in the older versions it would be translated as loving kindness. It's, it's this abiding, uh, a word I'll use and not define, but covenantal love uh, that is relentless and just and, and um, it, it, it is so much more than often what we think of as a love, a, the way that we throw that around in our culture. Um, and so it is, uh, God's law is characterized by his loving kindness and by uh, his faithfulness. Two very, very important aspects of who God is. And first and foremost, we should see that about God through God's law. And then when we seek to follow God's law, we then seek uh, to follow, uh, to show God's character in what we do. You know, we do this by exhibiting that same loving kindness, that same covenantal love to the rest of the world, to the, to the rest of humanity, and to the rest of creation. It, it's the lens through which we need to be seeing each other and the lens through which we need to be seeing this world. Right now, um, it seems more that we uh, are seeing the world through the lens of polarity, through the lens of, of right and wrong in, in, in some ways frighteningly um, absolutist ways. Uh, it's, it's a fascinating development, really, in, in some ways. Um, and yet, it's terrifying as well. 
God's law implores us uh, instead here. Uh, is Solomon implores us to put on God's law, uh, God's law to his teaching, to bind it around our necks, to write it on the tablets of our heart, to, ne to view everything through God's loving kindness and through God's faithfulness. You know, there is, um, it's so easy right now um, with technology, and, and technology has really enabled this where we can um, ignore and we can leave behind and we can unfriend and unfollow and, and, and whatnot, whereas God's faithfulness, when we think about how unfaithful we have been, if you would put up uh, my holiness versus the holiness of God, there would be no comparison. It, it, it would be nothingness compared to everything. Um, and yet, when we consider the whole hu history of humanity and how in the story of Scripture God has been faithful to us, even though time and time again we have turned from Him, um, and we see that characteristic of God. It is illuminating for the way that we should be engaging the world around us, the people around us, our family, our friends, um, those that we work with, those, those who um, are of the family of faith. A and to then also apply this covenantal love, this, this deep, magnificent, relentless love to interactions with God and to interactions with one another. And what Solomon is saying is that these things need to be so ingrained in our hearts that it becomes like the DNA of all of our actions. It, it, it is the guiding, the, the guiding, controlling aspect of all of our actions and all of our interactions and all of our, intera all of our attitudes. Not just something that, that, okay, I have to do this and I, I don't do this and, oh, what am I supposed to do here? But it is something that becomes deep in our very core, deep in our very being, written, as it says there, on the tablet of our heart, becoming a part of the DNA of who we are. You know, DNA may not always be seen, uh, you know, uh, DNA may not be seen, excuse me, but the effects of DNA in the fallen world are seen both good and bad. In the same way, people may not see that it is our love of God and our reflection of his loving kindness and his faithfulness, but it will be reflected in our actions. Talked about that a little bit in the Ecclesiastes text. But, uh, and like I said, next week we'll go into some specific um, ways, first ways to, to show this uh, and how to live this out. But for right now, we can ask ourselves to build that foundation what is my attitude towards God's law? What's my attitude towards God's teaching? You know, this, this can go in a whole spectrum of responses. Uh, some of you might be thinking, you know, this sounds like a real drag. And I, there were times in my life that I remember that I just, oh my gosh, rule after rule after rule. When does it end? The, some of you may be saying, you know, I'm okay with it. It it's, isn't good or bad. I'll, uh, you know, but I'm I'm all right with it. Uh, some of us, uh, some of you, maybe think of it like a buffet. Like, oh yeah, I'd I'd love parts of this, and I I I'd love parts of this, but you know, I think I'm gonna pass on these aspects. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, and but hopefully, hopefully. We are moving on this spectrum from these things to um, an attitude of delight and joy with respect to God's law. 
you know, I, I, I love God's law. I, I, I see the Creator in, in those things. I see Him reflected and I see His love abound when, when my life seeks to be in line with Him. The way we can ask ask this is say, is to say, okay, if my actions had DNA, what would compose that DNA? What would others say were, was the core DNA of everything that I do? You know, fa some people say, you know, family is at the heart of everything I do. It's who I am. I'm a family person. And that just family controls all my act, uh, uh, how I make all my decisions. You know, what's the, the, the DNA at the heart of our behaviors and our attitudes? Is it survival? Is it avoiding pain? Is it um, finding the least resistance to getting some alone time? or to getting to the next uh, enjoyable experience, or what is it? And what is it that others would say is the DNA of our actions and our attitudes and behaviors? Like I said, this isn't about a ticket to, he ticket to heaven. It's not. But it's not surprising that the teacher notes that there are benefits to living a life in, in congruence with God's law, with God's teachings. You know, as we're thinking about this and we're building this foundation, there is a natural question of what's in this for me? And, and Solomon answers that here, um, that God's teachings bring us peace. Now, we have to define that just a little bit, because peace is a little bit different for each uh, person. Some of us might be saying, you know, peace for me is getting to sit down and watch uh, USA for an hour and see what the, the latest rerun of Law & Order is. Or it, it may be a, a favorite movie, or it may be a favorite activity. Some people like to puzzle. Um, it could be a walk, it could be... Uh, getting to golf, it could be any number of, of things, you know, and, and we can define peace in different ways. Uh, but we have to ask here, what does it mean in this scripture to have peace? Well, that great word in Hebrew, shalom, very rarely will I, will I use a Hebrew or a Greek word, but, but I think shalom is one that people are kind of familiar with. It, it means a wholeness. Uh, a, a wholeness of life, a, a, um, a wholeness of health and of vitality. It's a rich and meaningful existence. And that's rich in quality. It's, it's not saying a certain amount in your bank account, but it is rich in quality. Like, mmm, that chocolate was so rich. Uh, that, that sort of... of uh, rich and meaningful existence. Um, it, and since Proverbs are always in relationship to God, Proverbs, Psalms, Ecclesiastes, Job, all assume that it's in, in relationship to God, it means that this rich and meaningful existence has to be in relationship with God as well. A, and this gets shown in the fact that, um, excuse me, this gets shown in the fact that we can get tired of doing good or doing good things or, uh, or what not on our own. That eventually we want some me time. We, we eventually default to a little bit of narcissism. But when we see our work as having a divinely appointed significance in bringing order to a small amount of chaos in this world, or redemption to a small amount of brokenness in this, uh, in this world. That it is a part of God's mission and that he has included us in this task of bringing order out of chaos. Then we find richness and meaning that is 
above and beyond, far beyond ourselves, far beyond ourselves. And then as well, this peace means that our relationships are put right as well. You know, part of peace in life is only experienced in relationship with others. So, you know, John Donne, no man is an island unto himself. And, and so, you know, Donne here is reflecting uh, some of these concerns in Scripture. And what we understand from that is that then that we won't experience peace until it is experienced in a communal way, in a relational way, if that's a more helpful term for you, uh, in relationship to, with God and with others. Think about Moses for a second. His relationship with God. He was known as a friend of God. Someone that God looked on favorably. Someone that God looked on, um, okay, yes, with, with, uh, with a bit of anger at times, but by and large as someone in whom God was happy to deal with and happy to speak with. And, and and even revealed just a smidgen of his glory to Moses. And so, what would it mean to me, and what would it mean to you, if we were known as having favor in the sight of God, and in the sight of others? Well, what would it mean to be a friend of God, someone whose relationship with God was characterized by loving kindness and faithfulness, such that we never doubted our, our standing in front of God. That, that's a, an almost unfathomable thought. The, the brokenness of this world just presses so much on me that, that I, I have trouble getting my head around what that would even mean. But what a base to build on, to consider what it would mean to have favor in God's sight. But this is exactly what Solomon says, to have God's uh, law, to ha have God's teachings bound around our neck like a chain on our hearts uh, and written on our hearts like a tablet, to have it so close to us that it's reflective, that it's just a part of our DNA. That, that we do it without thinking. This is what earns us uh, favor in the sight of God and in the sight of others, through integrity, through loving uh, kindness, and through faithfulness that comes from obedience to God's law. Now, it's... I, I, I want to say um, that it, this is a good point to re remind myself and to remind you that Proverbs are not promises. It's not if you do this, then you will absolutely get this. But Proverbs are um, descriptions of the way that life broadly works, all things being equal. And we know that in life all things are not equal. But at the end of the day, uh, Proverbs reminds us that the way to peace isn't through a project of self-fulfillment. It's not through a project of, uh, of trying to go out and do the most good. It's not in a project that we try to build meaning for ourselves, but it is something that is built through remembering, obeying God's law and finding life in that. That is the description uh, that Proverbs gives us, gives us here in terms of what the wise child, and all of us are children, what the wise child does, remembers and finds life. That's God's word for us today. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your teaching. Thank you for who you are. Help us to live in light of that and to use this as a foundation in our lives.